Hello and welcome back to the channel, hopefully in pristine audio. Um, if you didn't catch the basement tapes video, I have I have acquired a new setup. Uh, I'm having to use an external webcam and an external microphone, but hopefully the pros outweigh the cons and, and the quality of things are better on my end. Um, I'm joined once again by Vanessa and Chris for another episode of our albums of the year this time we're looking at 1974 which is a very strange year and a year i believe the three of us are going to have differing views on which is kind of cool um but i'll start with me i historically always considered this like the weakest year of the 70s um and Vanessa shakes her head that's the tone for this video um but uh you know i think i've kind of come around a bit on 1974 i've discovered some some new gems that may or may not make my top 10 which is really cool and a couple albums that i knew i liked well one album in particular i knew i liked that has really shot up my ranks so um that's pretty cool it's, it's still not one of the best 70s years for me but um I'd, it's not as drastic a step down from 73 as I originally thought. Uh, Chris, how are you feeling about 1974? Uh, yeah. I, some aspects very strong. I um, Some particular genres, I think, really started to shine around here. Um, but some of the, like, funk and metal that you know, the last couple of years were really strong in. I found less of this year and um, some of the heavy hitters that people talk about just didn't really resonate with me as much as I was hoping. So I'm sorry if I have some what may seem like obvious omissions, but, um, you know, I don't have a doctorate in music. These are just my lame opinions. Um, yeah, it might be one of the weaker years so far. Um I did get to five, so or ten, excuse me. Uh, I did, I did get there. So it's not all lost, and there's obviously good stuff here. But uh, yeah, I had to dig a bit. So anyway, we'll get into that. Yeah, I think to say it's one of the weak years so far is it's not necessarily a slight on seventy four. Like the music we've been going through is insanely high quality, and I would still probably take it without having done the deep dive over most years post 1980. So, you know, it's it's still great. Vanessa, I know you feel differently to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this year gets an unfair bad rap and it kind of drives me crazy. And like, I've seen people call it the worst year in all of music. They're talking about the charts, but even still, like I can't even see how you could even look at like, this year and say that but anyway um but we're not talking about the charts i mean we're talking about albums but i think what leads people to that conclusion is a lot of the big heavy hitters they either don't have albums or they have contentious albums that people are very mixed opinions on and i think that gives the illusion that this is a weak year it's an illusion because i have just as many high scores this year as any of these other years i have 44 eight and eights and above so that is about the same as any of the other 70s years so so far. So I don't see it as a weak year. And a lot of those contentious albums I even like. So I don't know, like, I'm here to give it its due. And like, just know, I can't talk about everything, obviously. We only get 10, as Chris always says. But most of those contentious albums or those albums that people talk about are probably in those eights and above that I like. So... Like I had yeah. almost twenty nines and above, so, so that's still. I had five. <laughs> no. um, yeah, but you know, it's. I think the point I will agree with is in terms of like depth, it's still crazy good. Like I still have a top twenty-five that I can post. Be like, I recommend all these albums. These albums are all great. So that's not really the problem for me. The problem for me is that even the albums I really like this year, I can poke holes in that I couldn't really with my top top albums in other years but I still think they're great you know they're still my favorites of the year so 
with all that out of the way, you can expect a fiery episode um, ahead. <laughs> uh, I'll be kicking us off. Chris will be going in second. And then Vanessa will have the honor of sending off 1974 in terms of albums and in terms Let's of songs. Get more optimistic as we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's going to be an upward trend. Um, so, yeah. Making my albums list was fairly straightforward. I had two strong albums at 11 and 12, which were newer discoveries. So it was harder to justify putting them in the top 10. So I didn't, but uh, Phenomenon by UFO and Heart Like a Wheel by R Linda Ronstadt were my 11 and 12. Uh, so maybe with time, those would get up there, but this is where I'm at now. My number 10 is I Want to See the Bright Lights Tonight by Richard and Linda Thompson. Uh, my 10 through 6, you'll notice a trend, and I'm going to say the word front-loaded a lot, because <laughs> all these albums are extremely strong at the front. Not necessarily bad in the back, but not quite as good. And I think this is one of the most ridiculously front-loaded albums of all time. Like, the first five songs are all among the best songs Richard Thompson ever wrote. And then the last five songs are pretty good. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's kind of where that album lands, but the quality of the best stuff is enough to get up to number 10. Number nine is Joni Mitchell with Court and Spark. Similar story. First four songs, absolutely nuts, incredible, so good. Uh, S tier Joni. Rest of the album is also very good, but you know, if, if we were doing like a track elimination, for example, my final four songs would be the first four songs. Um, and again, that's not the worst thing in the world the rest of the album is still pretty great it's just when you when you're leading off with your best foot forward it, it can sort of make the listening experience a bit disjointed but i would still recommend it it's probably my second favorite johnny mitchell album it's miles behind blue but it's still number two um my number eight is the first of two new discoveries in my top 10 it is kimono my house by sparks now now those of you that know me know that over the years I've become less and less attracted to this sort of over-the-top glammy like excess style of the 70s you know the likes of Queen and and what have you. Sparks though this album in particular the songs are just too good like the songs just get lodged in your head it's, again especially the first half but I think with this one the second half is is almost as strong um but that opening three track run of uh, uh, This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us, Amateur Hour, and uh, I'm Falling in Love with Myself Again, that's just, that's S tier right there. So yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised by that one after hearing so many great things over the years. I finally checked it out and I was glad I did. Number seven, similarly excessive and over the top is The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway by Genesis also similarly front loaded but this time it's disc one of two that is absolutely incredible and then disc two is also pretty good but based on disc one it would be in my top five comfortably you know we're talking the title track carpet crawlers counting out time these are all just incredible songs and the flow from track to track is really great as well as you'd expect from a rock opera and then my number six another front loaded album <laughs> is a uh, pretzel logic by steely dan uh, which I assumed would be in my top five, but uh, just fell out. Has some of my favorite Silly Dan songs. I think it was my number two Silly Dan album. So there you go. Um, number five, Crime of the Century by Supertramp, which, again, those people that know me who knew me when I was 16 years old know that Supertramp was one of my favorite, first favorite bands um, because they were my dad's favorite band. This is my dad's favorite album of all time. And I initially fell head over heels in love with the band and listened to all their sort of classic four records and over and over again. So I kind of know them like the back of my hand. Um, but, you know, just like with Pink Floyd, they kind of slipped out of my listening and over the years just was less what I was looking for. But I came back to it for this and it's, it's, it's probably the most I've liked it since it was one of my favorite albums of all time when I was, you know, 16. Uh, I've always loved the bookend tracks, the sort of relentless multi-part rocker of school and the epic piano ballad title track. Um, the rest of the album's pretty great too, but the songs that really stuck me, with me this time were the ballads, Hide in Your Shell, Rudy, and If Everyone Was Listening. I think having the two lead vocalists really helps the album sort of 
uh, in, in terms of variety and stuff as well. So yeah, great album that was very important to my musical discovery. Um, already throwing the curveballs in my top five and you know the artists probably won't surprise people but like Vanessa was saying a lot of big artists were releasing divisive albums my number four is I wouldn't say divisive but the fact that this is the first of my top five from this group is probably going to surprise some people it's Deep Purple with Burn um from the opening riff, the title track, you know you're in for one. <laughs> it would be very easy for that Barnstormer to overshadow the rest of the album. And while I do think it's the best song, I think the rest of the album has plenty to offer. David Coverdale is not Ian Gillen. That's true. They are not the same person. But he does a great job, and the band are in as great form as they've ever been. Um, you know, my favourite songs are Burn, uh, and then the middle two of Sail Away and You Fall No One. Um, I think people sort of sort of call this like meat and potatoes bluesy hard rock but there's so much more to it there's sort of like an r&b influence a psychedelia influence it's just such a cool sound and i do prefer in rock which did not make my top five of 1970 but 1970 is maybe my favorite year ever so um burn is still excellent and absolutely loaded with great tracks and could have been higher if it wasn't the other new discovery on my list what is my top three? Well, these are all pretty usual suspects for me in terms of artists, I must admit. My number three is David Bowie with Diamond Dogs, um, an album I hadn't heard since the first time I got into Bowie, so it was very fun to go back. I do think it's pretty underrated overall. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody loves the A-side. I mean, Diamond Dogs, Sweet Thing Candidate, Sweet Thing Reprise, that sort of sweet is great. And then Rebel Rebel, I mean... Are you really going to find somebody who doesn't like that? But where it gets a bit more contentious, I think, is the B-side, which is sort of like part of a scrapped rock opera slash musical based on George Orwell's 1984, which is weird. Um, but I think Rock and Roll With Me and 1984 are two of Bowie's most underrated deep cuts. And uh, yeah, I pretty much like every song on the album. It almost feels like an unintentional precursor to his Berlin albums in the sense that the first side flows really well as one thing and then the second side is completely different, but it also flows really well as one piece. And people talk about like, oh, it's not cohesive, so it's not good. I'm like, well, each half of the album is very cohesive. It's like two mini albums put together and that's cool to me. So uh, I think it's great. It's actually my assumed number two, but it's been leapfrogged by... Curtis Mayfield, of course, of course, with Sweet Exorcist. Only Curtis's second appearance in my top fives. Superfly had a hard time to get in in 72, but this one was always going to make my top five. I think it's definitely his most underrated album. Probably one of the most obscure albums I've picked in any of my top fives. Um, but I think every song is just great. Um, the closer is a bit forgettable, but it's nice while it's on. But I love the sort of head bopping opener, ain't, um, ain't Got It, which is great. The title track is so dreamy. Got a song like Kung Fu, which is so fun and funky and infectious and kind of weird, but also very introspective. Um, and the true highlight of the album for me is one of Curtis's great introspective songs, To Be Invisible, which has probably the best set of lyrics he ever wrote. Uh, not quite as excellent as his two great classics, but it's it's right behind and I think it's definitely worth your time. Um, because I, I don't think enough people know the album. So there's me dying on the hill for, for Sweet Exorcist. And of course, my number one is On the Beach by Neil Young. Um, everybody knew this was coming. Uh, the ultimate grower, in my opinion, uh, has gone from an album I thought was just kind of fine to a top five Neil Young album, who is one of my favorite artists of all time. Probably could be even higher with time as well. I think Walk On is one of the best opening tracks you could imagine. It just sets the tone so perfectly. And then, you know, everybody talks about the epic Ambulance Blues and the title track, which are some of the best songs they have, he ever wrote in terms of pure lyricism. The whole album sort of sounds like the album cover, which is, you know, kind of cool. It's like this downbeat, depressed summer sound, which is cool. Um, the songs aren't his most immediately melodic, but they really creep into your subconscious over time. And it really flows nicely from track to track. He has a great atmosphere. Um, might be the only time Neil ever wins. So if anything, I'm grateful that 1974 is a little bit weaker for me because, you know, 
uh, this is probably his best chance, and he and he did win. So, congrats, Neil. Um, uh, you'll be seeing plenty more, Neil, but probably not in first place. Uh, but yeah, um, really, really awesome album, and and a worthy winner, I think. Yeah, I guess I saw some of that coming. Definitely saw Neil Young coming. Uh, and I guess we share one in the top five. That's all I'm just saying. Okay, 1974. Yeah, yeah. A little weird. Got some got some weird stuff going on. So just bear with me here. <laughs> uh honorable mentions. Yeah. Uh my number 10 is going to be The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Uh, I didn't really like this the first time I heard it. <laughs> uh, didn't really click with me. So re-listening this time was, it was a good, it was a better experience. Um, maybe having listened to more Genesis uh, since that time has been to my benefit and just more music in context of the time. Um, I don't know that I love it, <laughs> but I did like it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's pretty fun at least. And it, it made my top 10. So there you go. Um, not to be outdone. Number nine, I have read by King Crimson. Uh, if not for Providence, this could be a five. I don't know why they do this on every record. All right. Anyway, doesn't matter. Number eight. <laughs> Number eight is Apostrophe by Frank Zappa. This is, yeah, yeah, I know this is the first shout out for Frank Zappa I've given. And, it, and it's probably overdue. I didn't give Mothers of Invention any love. I don't think I did. Anyway, I, I listened and I enjoyed them, but um, this one is this one is wild. Uh, Frank Zappa, pretty volatile artist, and uh, when he hits, he hits. And this one was a was a winner in a wacky year like this. So that's number eight. Uh, number seven is "On the Beach" by Neil Young. Yeah, sorry, not even top five, but Neil still putting up great stuff. I I agree with a lot of what you said. And although this isn't like my top of the year, uh, several very memorable tracks and the instrumentation throughout is just like really great. So um, cool, cool songs. And my final uh, honorable mention is No Other by Gene Clark and not my usual haunt for sure. Uh, but I'm very thankful that I checked it out. Uh, this is really great stuff. And uh, again, in a year like 1974, uh, I guess anything goes. And I I dug, I, I tried to dig a bit. So there we have it. No other. There is no other. Now there's five others. Um, and these five. <laughs> okay. Number five. I'm going. Oh, someone's at my door. All right. Never mind. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. Number five <laughs> is Propaganda by Sparks. Yeah, the other one. Um, this record is just, it's just so much fun. And, um, I, yeah, I, I really like Sparks self-titled. I think that was the last time I gave them a shout out, uh, half Nelson when they were called that for one record, half a record, whatever. Um, and kind of since then I've been tracking their, their records and, uh, this one was great. It's only like 30 minutes. And I just think they put on this theatrical romp that keeps you wondering what the hell is going on, but they've really kind of settled into their stride at this point. And uh, I love just most of these songs. It's just such a great take on glam rock. They're, they're, they kind of picked up a torch, um, you know, that was kind of abandoned by, I don't know, T-Rex and at this point Bowie and kind of made it their own. And uh, I just think it's, it's kind of, a peak of of maybe the genre i don't know i don't know i just love it i can't really explain it that's propaganda that's number five uh number four i'm gonna go with pretzel logic by steely dan okay another year in the 70s another great steely dan record i mean no surprise 
Um, but this record really storms on with uh, Ricky Don't Lose That Number, Night by Night, and then Any Major Dude. I mean, just three awesome, <laughs> awesome tracks, instant classics, or at least 49 year later classics. We can at least agree on that. Um, and I do think, that, you know, the rest of the album after that is maybe a little bit weaker than those three, but I think it holds up pretty well. It doesn't like slog by any means. Shut up, Tom. Let me speak. And I, 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 I don't think there's any duds here. I really don't. I, I don't think there's any bad songs. I think the opening three are just that strong. Um, anyway, they, they keep making the smoothest jams, songs to sail to, whatever. All right. That's number four. Probably not my favorite Seely Dan record, but it's it's very good, and I don't have to rank them necessarily. Um, not now, anyway. All right, uh, that puts me on number three. Okay, bronze medal goes to Crime of the Century by Super Tramp. Oh man, you know I I've always loved Breakfast in America, um, and for some reason I never really I, okay I knew some of these songs, but I don't think I'd ever sat down and listened to this whole record. Um, and I don't know why, because Breakfast in America has always been great. Like this zany, arty, you know, pop. It's it's just it's fun. It's it's a cut above a lot of the other stuff and um, that I would otherwise associate it with when I was younger. So I don't know why I didn't like even think about trying to check them out more. Um, but this was just a great experience. I've I've listened to it a couple of times and um just these these artsy pop prog sensibilities that are like always a little bit fun um there's just there's too many good tracks here so uh it's it's very comfortably uh bronze medal for 1974 crime of the century great record love it um my oh i just minimized everything <laughs> oh jeez i'm a mess <laughs> okay all right mm -hmm. silver medal goes to silver medal sorry I lost it. silver medal goes to fulfilling this's first finale okay uh yeah it's it's hard to it was hard to rank this record actually um because it's quite different from intervision and um the, the record to follow uh but I love like every song on here. They're they're definitely slower, sparser, more introspective than a, a lot of the stuff he's done. Yet, um, they're at least more yeah they're at least more introspective. Whatever doesn't matter. But but every song is is very very great. Uh, I hadn't listened to this for a long time. Um, even though I know it's like part of his classic period, it's not one that I necessarily reach for. But I'm really glad that I did because uh, a lot of these songs I w was clearly like sleeping on. And uh, yeah, the the personal tracks, the memorable track. I mean, it's just it's a wonderful experience. If you haven't listened in a while, I highly recommend you go check it out because um, I think this stacks up. It's not going to be my favorite, but it's it's very, very good. And uh, it's it's my second favorite of 1974, which, of course, <laughs> My number one is Kimono My House by Sparks. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got two Sparks in my top five, but look, it's 1974. What are you going to do? Um, yeah, I am I am a Sparks convert. I I, I tried just a taste, and, and now I'm an addict. Be careful, kids. This can happen to you. Um, yeah, so there's, like, this obvious lineage from Sparks to Ween for me. It's like, you know, these two brothers... We aren't really brothers, but, you know, they, they they assume this persona of brothers and, you know, they're very eclectic and, and the music is anyway, that, I, I'm digressing. This record is definitely the best of 1974 that I could find. <laughs> um, the songs are just so fun. They're interesting. They they keep you wondering what the hell's going on, but also bobbing your head. Um, and the, the falsetto is just on point for for 35 minutes straight. I mean, it's incredible. Um, 35 minutes is like a perfect length for this record. I think if it were like as long as a 1998 record, it might start to grate <laughs> um, because of the nature of this, but it's, it's so, it's just like a tidy package. And I think they, they 
did everything better here than they did on propaganda, basically. Um, and this one came first, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, it doesn't matter. W whatever. Um, Sparks knows how to write just great, fun music. It's infectious. Most of these songs get stuck in my head. And uh, this is my only 10 for 1974. So it had to win. And it's Sparks. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Vanessa. I'm sorry to your dad. But it's it's come out of my house. That's it. <laughs> Well, that was the most underwhelming end to a review. <laughs> That's it. This ends. Sorry, my winner. Um, wow. Well, this is how I felt during 1968, Vanessa. So <laughs> it, we're all going to have our turns. So just well, I expected it to soak it up and 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 enjoy waxing lyrical about your favorites because we're done now. Yeah. Hey, it's a ten. <laughs> I got to ten. That's a win, right? Well, I have That's four a... of them, so. <laughs> okay well and probably eventually six i don't know I, I flirted with that idea for two of them for a very close so we'll see um anyway my list is different for the most part um so starting at number 10 is big star with radio city which is not as good as number one record um i it's funny because every time I put it on, it starts off and I'm like, oh, why am I underrating this? Like, why isn't this a five? I mean, a 10. And like those first bunch of songs are so great. There's a few not so great songs in there that bring it down a little bit, but I still love it. So that's number 10. Number nine is Pretzel Logic by Steely Dan. Great. Love it. Um, I do like some of the songs in the back half a lot, too, as well as the opening track. So I kind of disagree on that a little bit, but uh, number eight, Diamond Dogs, which I agree, very underrated. And I underrated it in the past. Like when I went through his whole catalog last year, I zoomed through all these and I think I just didn't get it at the time. But when I went back to it for this, I was like, wow, yeah, this, this album's awesome. What was I talking about? So yeah, number, number eight, number seven is one that has fallen for me a little bit, um, and that is Fulfilling Mrs. First Finale, a Stevie Wonder. I still love it, but I don't know. It just didn't hit the same this time around. <laughs> it's just, but yeah, I agree. It's great. All the songs are great. It's just didn't feel that same because I had it as my number two Stevie Wonder when I ranked all of his albums last year, which I can't say I agree with that now. So it's still classic. It's still in the top echelon, but yeah, number seven. And number six is my new love. I have heard this album several times in the last week. I just can't get enough. And yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an all timer eventually, I think. Um, and that is Late for the Sky by Jackson Brown. I love this. And I just want to take a minute to pay tribute to David Lindley, who played electric guitar throughout the album and as well as lap steel and fiddle and stuff. And he is just amazing. Like his guitar work on this album just elevates it. Like, and we lost him earlier this year, sadly. So just want to take a minute for him. Anyway, top five. Number five is Todd by Todd Rundgren, which I know I talk about him a lot probably going to continue to sorry <laughs> not sorry um so this is probably one of the least immediate Todd albums for me of the ones that I regard highly though um it's a true grower um my appreciation has definitely taken time and several listens but once that appreciation was unlocked it has been a really rewarding album on here he delves further into the more experimental direction he started with on a wizard of true star but with more soundscapes and interesting sounds that are also juxtaposed by what some absolutely gorgeous and rocking songs, as well as, of course, a few silly ones. Almost like a blending of some of what he was doing on the previous two albums while creating something new in the process. Or in the, yeah, in the process. Of course, since the album is such a journey, it's not really a great one to start with if you're new to him. But if you give it time, it is absolutely worthwhile. My number five. Number four is Red by King Crimson. Um, this was the first album that really made King Crimson click for me. I remember playing it for the first time on a hot summer day a few years back, and it was just the perfect experience. Uh, the heaviness of the title track is just so cool and always exciting to hear. 
rest of the album is an enchanting marriage of heaviness and beauty that makes it such a cool and unique experience. But of course, King Crimson have to improv it up a bit on Providence, which is definitely less tight than the other songs. But I can't imagine the album without it. So at this point, this is my favorite King Crimson album and one I return to often. Number three is one that no one has mentioned even a little bit, and that is Grievous Angel by Graham Parsons. Um, GP is a great album that put the spotlight on the amazing rapport between Graham and Emmy Lou, but their true potential is realized on this album. Unfortunately, since this is a posthumous release, it's the last album, but I'm happy that we have it. I think overall the songs are a bit stronger here than the previous album, and their chemistry is unmatched. They also bring some great musicians along to join them, which further enhances all these songs. And it's an easy listen where all the songs are so good that time flies when you're listening to it. And they break your heart and they keep you entertained all at the same time. My number two, got a fleeting mention, but <laughs> it's Heart Like the Wheel by Linda Rodstad. Um, I know it's not cool, cool pick. I don't care. Um, I grew up hearing this around the house as my mom played it quite a bit when I was a kid. And I distinctly remember not liking it, but these things can change. Um, somewhere down the line, it has become a huge comfort album for me. It's not revolutionary stuff, which I think causes people to overlook it. But damn it if it's not a super consistent listen. Linda is a master interpreter, an amazing singer who brings the right delivery and emotions to every song. Not to mention the fantastic musicians that play on this album. Everything sounds great. Whenever I just want to listen to something that good and satisfying, I put this album on, which means I've heard it a lot. I think every song here is great. So like I have no zero skips. I could say. And number one, Tom will not delete his channel because of course there can be no other. Um, <laughs> no other by Gene Clark. Um, for many years, I only knew White Light. And for some reason, I just never explored further. And on the flip side, my dad only knew this album and nothing else. So at some point we traded, I got a copy of this from him and finally decided to check it out. And I was absolutely blown away because it's quite different from White Light. Um, it, there's so much ha more happening and he's exploring more genres and styles. And not only that, the songs are still incredibly strong and memorable. Every time I listen to the album, I'm reminded just how much I love these songs and how they make me feel. The only way I can describe it is that my heart soars on every, and every chorus hits, and it's just one of those albums that it's now impossible to remember my life without. So, had to be number one. So, what did your dad <laughs> think of White Light? <laughs> oh, he likes it. He actually he says it kind of feels like he always knew it. But he didn't, oh, you know, it's got one of those okay. qualities. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I mean, we do occasional polls here. And I think on the beach versus come out of my house versus no other could be a pretty tight, pretty tight poll. Kind of appeals to all different crowds. So stay tuned yeah. for that. Um, uh, if you are not subscribed, please do. We are here most weeks. Um, occasionally we take weeks off. That There may be a week off coming soon because I'm going to be traveling a lot and, and you yeah, know it's a busy time of year and uh but yeah if not every week every other week um you'll be you'll be hearing from us and uh definitely week from now you'll be seeing our favorite songs of 1974 so you don't want to miss that see if we have any overlap there we've been waiting since 1967 i don't think this is going to be the year based on our albums lists and how much <laughs> disparity there was there which is cool it's cool that there's so much differences because We've been lining up on a lot recently. So, um, yeah, please subscribe, like the video, tell a friend about the channel. We would love to have more people on board. We're getting close to 300 subscribers. So if you can help in that effort, that would be greatly appreciated. And uh, hopefully we'll catch you soon. <laughs>